and I thought, oh my God, and then I listened to Aretha Franklin, and I said, oh no, I can't compete with that. I absolutely don't want to sing, you know, because I didn't think I had the voice, and my voice was very deep, and um, finally, uh, I believe I had a German teacher in New York, and she said to me, every voice is different, so I had to come to the part of me that said, okay, now I'm going to sing like this. And everybody said, no, you sound like a man, <laughs> basically. And um, the radar couldn't mix my voices, like with Diana Ross, a long same time the radio, you know, they had to mix a certain way. I think it was a part of what they studied or something like that. So of course, when I finally I said, well, if I cannot sing with my voice, then I don't know to sing, you know? And then finally, I think when I met, um, I, I just decided that's how I'm going to do it or I'm not going to do it because I didn't want to do something I was feeling uncomfortable, uncomfortable with, you know? And one thing led to another and then meeting, you know, in, in my path, the right people that were just there, you know? Uh, even if they weren't there, they, they're always there, the thing is, how do you get together with them? And most of the time, it's someone else who is saying, oh, you should meet this girl, you know? That's what happened. And I mentioned Chris Blackwell with Island because that's, that happened. I was with Island a year before I even met Chris, but somebody went to Chris and said, oh, this is Jamaican girl, you know, you should meet her. And um, all of this is on an interview, honestly, to the written long play with Chris being interviewed and myself. And we met in New York, and, um, and then again, then that took off to another road. And then that brought in Chris's ideas of, you know, getting Sly and Robbie and putting this whole Congress Point band together. And he just put a picture up in the studio, big picture, with me with a flat top. Nobody knows why I was very pregnant at the time. <laughs> it's the one where I'm like a samurai with a Japanese writing warm leather wet. And, um, and I'm sweating. Yeah. Give me a fan. Sorry. <laughs> a many fans. Sorry. <laughs> and, um, and then, you know, he, he basically said there was Wally Badaru from uh, French Africa. Um, there was uh, Mikey Chong, also from Jamaica. And, oh, thank you. Do the work. It's, it's your soup. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Let me kiss you. <laughs> and basically, you know, um, Chris said, okay, hey, you guys go, go and make, a, make some music that looks like that picture. And uh, this whole new wave of music at the time, and it was just a, a, a collaboration and feeling right with the right person. Um, because I, I'm an amateur. I mean, I, I'm a professional because I don't insist to be paid all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel that there's more to learn, always. And that you have to, you know, the right person has to have the right intention that is working with you. If they have the wrong intentions, then they can lead you in the wrong way and then you really have to fight. And I'm a fighter. I'm a fighter, so I'll, 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 you know, pour champagne on your head or whatever, <laughs> or, or a milkshake if you ask me to do something that I really feel uncomfortable with, you know, and if I, and it's instinctive, you have to have your antennas always, you have to be clear enough in what your passion, what is the road you're following uh, in order to make the right decisions, you know, and um, so this led to another thing. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, because you talk about why I never thought like being superstar or any of that. I never, that's never ever in my past, you know, in my life. I just follow the passion of what it is that I, I like to do. It is something I feel. I don't like to do this right now, but what can I learn from doing that at that moment? So you pick up things and you add it to your 
to your knowledge, you know. It's all about learning. And um, from there, then, of course, I really wanted to do film. But film didn't really come until after I did the music, did the video, um, the one, one man show it was called. And then Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, it's called, you know. So, so these things leading to the next, to the next, and, and just being open-minded enough and you know, making the right decisions. And when you make those decisions, you have to do them the best that you can do, even if it means studying, because I actually studied <coughs> voice. I had to study voice to know my voice and to grow my voice to make my range um, bigger you know, to extend it, it's like working out. You know, the voice is, is a muscle, so you learn all these things. So you do these exercises, and then you, you get the tricks from opera singers, you know, and um, and you just pick up all these things, and they just go and go, you know, when they work with Keith Haring, or with um, Andy Warhol, you know, you just bring the artists in that actually are inspired to do their work and also wanting to work with you as well, to collaborate. So collaborating is what's very important. And I believe I made some very lasting, very good decisions artistically <coughs> with my collaborations. Yeah, I don't collaborate with people that just want to like ride on my back like a frog, you know. <laughs> the one that gets on the frog's back and goes take me across the river and then rides you. I mean, you, you, get, you get a lot of people like that that will just come and want to ride on your back and they bite you. And they, they, they survive and then you're gone. So you, you like, like, and I look everybody really in the eye. So that's very important. If people are asking you, to do something and they're yes, like, Yes, oh, Gina, that's true. Uh, no. no. So, yes. So, so that's I really how appreciate I the fact that you're doing Dr. Carolyn Cooper interviewing her as her documentary had carried. Being in the right place, finding the right people that you can work with. Yes, it's so true. Now, one of the things that fascinated me listening to, you know, watching the documentary was the impact of Jamaica, their mm -hmm. upbringing you know, in shaping who you became was was a force. <laughs> you know, but you despite the abuse, as you would say, the whole about beating, mm -hmm. you can still hear the love of Jamaica. So that's kind of yes. the how when you I see Jamaica. Mm -hmm. Well I don't know my aunt Sibyl, I don't know if she's here tonight. <laughs> aunt Sibyl, you there? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> No, yeah, Judea. she knew. Judea. Really? My, my father's sister, you know. Oh. Um, <laughs> honestly, um, I know, I know, I would recognize her and I'd hear her voice very loudly if she was, so you can't pretend. <laughs> oh. Um, her teeth are so pretty. Well, after, you know, we all migrated back to to America, not back to America, but with my mom and dad. I came, none of us really, my siblings, we said we would never, that we would never ever come back. You know, we never, never yeah, we said we would never, never, because there was, oh, there was just so much um, pain attached, um, the ghost of pain, and um, I don't know, I just- Can you hear no Gina? Something just said to me, you need to go on your own. And I was in touch with the other premier, Oh, tomorrow. She said, yes, ma'am, come back, come, you know. And um, she just got a car. And I, I think I had a French, my first French boyfriend at the time, Jean-Yves. Uh, and um, he came with me and she said, just take a car and go all around the island. She drew a map where to stop, what to do. She said, you need to discover your home for yourself. Wow. Yeah. And that's what I did. Yeah, I know. No, yeah, yeah, so she 
did this in my phone, then, and we just spent two weeks stopping the river or on, on, on the rowing and the Rio Grande and just all over Jamaica. And, and, and I fell in love. I said, yeah, this is not the Jamaica I, that, that I grew up with, you know. Um, I grew up in a bubble, you know. I was surrounded by very, um, from Bishop, uh, my grandmother was the Bishop of Pentecostal of the island. And then, um, then my separate father became the Bishop. Now my brother then became the Bishop, but he's not much more. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. And uh, then I said, okay, uh, that's it. I fell in love and I just kept coming and I started bringing my brothers and sisters back as well. I said, no, man, you have to come. It's not like that. It's not like that at all. You know, it's, we, we can just, you know, it, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So that's what happened there, you know. And, um, and now I'm here more than anywhere. I'm, I'm, I'm here a lot. Even if I go out, I'm always um, I'm coming back, you know, and working from here at least six months. Uh, what came across was just the pure magic of the landscape. You know, Jamaica is really beautiful. And sometimes we're here and we just take the beauty for granted, which we should not, you know. It is just a magnificent place. Thank you. Monitor deserves a lot. But, um, one of the interesting things for me is the role of religion. Because we are such a religious society. You know, they say we have so on every street corner, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I love to go to Helsha. I found you come off the highway to the reach Helsha. There are about 15 churches, and that's just on the main road. But it seems to me that the love that you talk about as being so important is so missing from a lot of the religiosity that, you know, people just. You know, they're so in love with God that they can't love their fellow man and woman. You know, and I just you know, That's true, Dr. Cooper. I just wonder that upbringing that you had, this the Pentecostal revival fire, that was just so destructive. Mm -hmm. And I know you may not want to go back there because you have worked it through, but I think for the sake of a lot of young people now, why the same book? What the planet? Like a big nail polish is devil worship. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no expression of your creativity, your femininity. All of that has to be confined and contained. Who oh, you boss up? <laughs> well, Jackson asked me that question actually once. Um, well, I tell you, Just they only went talking about the religion, right? There's a lot of hypocrisy. There's a lot of hypocrisy, and um, that's why I find that with my brother, Bishop Noel Jones, now he has the, the, the he's on the edge of the opposite of how we were brought up. If anyone follows his teachings, I wouldn't even call him a preacher because he really won't preach at you. There's a difference between preaching at you or teaching you. And he's a teacher, really, not a preacher. Um, I think that then gets more understanding and it's broader. You can't keep, keep, as the world changes, you have to change along with it. You can't stay stuck in the same teachings that no longer, or preachings that no longer make any sense as, as you know and this is why I will still go to church but only when he's talking <laughs> actually <laughs> um, but I do find that just going and opening a church so many churches it's like it's a business yes. it's, like, yeah, it's a business it's a business, it's a business. It's a business. Um, yes. Can I just say before? I just wanted to say before I forget. There's this minister who has just gotten two cars from a church member, oh, BMW and yeah, yeah, yeah. a Honda, and the people are telling him, "Give back the car." He said, "No, the fellow gave me the car because it was the will of God." And I just want to throw that. 
church name walk by faith. So the parish of them for walk. Never say him for walk. <laughs> You know, but it's all about, you know, the show. Um, sometimes one should just say, okay, I'm here and I would love, would have loved to have been an actor, but since I can't be an actor, I'm going to have to be a preacher in a church. Jesus. <laughs> and I know that my brother, one, not, not Bishop Noel, but I have a brother, actually. That wanted to be an actor, and then he didn't. Do that. <laughs> well, he didn't try wanting me to help him, and then he's like, okay, I just get up on the pulpit, you know, and uh, and act. So you see, again, it's, you know, oh, that's yeah. a serious statement. <laughs> My younger brother's not making me go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. No, but. It, but if, if, okay, let's say, even if that's what brought you to that place, that being a pastor, and maybe it was your wrong intent, you know, but you could also turn that around as well. So it's not necessarily a long-lasting thing, you know, your intention of why you want to have a church, because maybe you can be touched, you know. It's possible, I have to, you know, kind of, leave all of that open since I'm not the one really conducting all of this uh, stuff. But um, yeah, it's, I think that's, uh, uh, it freed me from being so inside to see the religion with the bishops and the pastors and from the inside to see what's going on really, you know, and um, and of course, you know, I was considered the, the devil. I was called the devil in, in my family. Um, not all of them, thank God. But in that particular so what were you bubble. Doing? What were you doing? No, well, when um, I started doing the, <laughs> becoming in the newspapers, of course, um, and TV and all of that, not for my father. My father stayed very mysteriously quiet, admiring. Uh, I found out many years later when uh, we went to South Africa and I, again, things happened in strange ways. Uh, but I had to convince my dad to go to South Africa because uh, he, he wanted to meet Nelson Mandela and I, he said, well, I promised him, but I didn't know if I could do it. <laughs> 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 it was my mom had to go to South Africa, and she didn't want it. She wanted that to come. And at uh, that time, Dad just wanted to, you know, not to travel so much. And um, so we went to Johannesburg, you know, and uh, I had no idea. And I was on the jury for the Miss World, Miss where Miss Jamaica won. I was on the jury. Yeah, and um, and sit, sitting next to me on the jury was Dali Tambo. And Dali Tambo, his father was uh, like a brother of Nelson Mandela, he was in exile to England. And I looked over to Dali Tambo, I said, do you know Nelson Mandela? <laughs> <laughs> yes, my dad, flying all this way, and I'm not wanting to, and I have to do this, I have to do this. And he said, oh, not sure I used to have it. But he said, yeah, he's my, um, he's my godfather. Mm. And I said, well, I promised my dad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and he said, well, I'm not sure, but I, I, he, he's um, campaigning for presidency at this time. And he said, okay, I will um, see what I can do. And the next thing I know, he set up a meeting with my dad, meet Nelson and yeah. Yeah. And, um, and that was the first time my dad actually went on a TV program with me. And these are things that's not in the film. Um, but these things really happened. And um, very magical, very magical. Because my dad always, you know, was being the bishop to the church in Syracuse. And, um, so he, you know, and coming from a political family, he was the only religious um, pastor, not 
I'm not even saying that we asked her, but his family basically came from the political side, you know, the, the librarians opening the, the the library system here and um, being judges and uh, magistrates and all that. And, uh, you yeah, know, so, oh, my train of thought just went in too many places. <laughs> bring me back, bring me back. Bring me back, yeah. TV show. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, the first time he went on the TV show uh, was in South Africa because he always had to kind of downplay me. You know, I constantly carried a secret picture that he was actually proud of where I was thinking of. You know, he had a little secret picture of the. Uh, yeah, yeah, but he could say openly because the church people, then. then sorry. The church people basically are saying you you need to to shun your daughter. You know, and then, you know, much later he said he would have become a bishop much longer time before if it hadn't been for me. But, you know, because he then finally got on TV and he said, what? She's just doing her job. <laughs> <laughs> She's just doing her job. And I thought, whoa, you go there. Okay, I didn't know you thought like that. You know what I mean? So it was a whole discovery thing for me about that. Yeah. So you left Jamaica at about 13 to go, 12, 12 to go to the States. What was that like, you know, the, the shock of being in Jamaica and now going to Syria? Mm -hmm. Sorry, well, that was not a shock. <laughs> no, it was a shock. It was a shock. I couldn't wait. Shock at all. Actually, the cold was a shock, but not leaving. You know, I had to deal with the, the, the really cold. But, um, and I didn't have any money to buy furs <laughs> or coats, you know, kind of like a big bear. Hmm. Yeah. So anyway, I think landing, uh, I remember the flies and just seeing so many uh, roads going in one direction thinking they're going to crash, they're going to crash. Because there's so many lanes going in one direction, I didn't think that was possible. You know, my first vision of that would be, well, there has to be another car coming in the other direction. It can't be so many lanes just going in one direction. Like, we should be Visually, for me, I just, I, I was complex. I was complex about that. I didn't understand how they got that to work. Um, and then I just remember uh, you know, the winter, even though it was spring when I got there. Uh, and yeah, uh, I just I started school, and the Jamaican school system, of course, uh, we started much earlier here. I don't know if they still do. Yeah, yeah. But when I was going to school, we started really early. So by the time I got to school there, I was already three Great. years ahead. I was three years ahead. Everybody thought because I, you know, I had already done that in my test. They were saying, "Yeah, but you know, you are. We're putting you behind where you should really be for my age." Yeah. So they, at, at the year end test, I ended up going three years ahead for my age, and everybody thought I thought, "Oh, she's really smart." But I was like, "No, not really." <laughs> So I ended up, you know, in a school that, uh, where I was very young, uh, much younger than the rest. And, um, and I just uh, studied, I wanted to be a linguist, study uh, teaching Spanish, because you know, you grow up in Jamaica, you have to be a teacher, a liar. Thank you. <laughs> it's like never the choices, you know. Really, in our family, it's like that. You and you, you make up your mind from you're really young, or they make it up for you. That's <laughs> what you're gonna do, and then you you strict on the studies, you know. 
and um, and I didn't mind that. As you know, I chose the languages. I thought, okay, I'm going to be a teacher, a language teacher. So I started with the Spanish, and the Spanish came to me even better than the English, which was funny. I did very good in math, except when I had a test. <laughs> tests uh, always. Uh, I, I don't like tests. <laughs> Actually, because of that. Thing. It kind of like panics, you know, and you end up not being able, you know, it's like ready, set, go, boom, and you have this amount of time to do it, and it's all this uh, algebra, and the geometry, and everything, it's all the, it's just a jungle, it's like just panic. Yeah, yeah I think our testing system is about how you can find stress. That, you, yes. know, you know, it, it has nothing to do with showing what you know. You know, that's I found, you know, teaching at the university of the lesson is that students perform exactly the same way on the exam as they do for their coursework. So we could easily get rid of all the exams. So there's a whole network of people who are doing exams who lose their jobs. So, you know, we have to keep the exam system good. But really, I think we need to get away from this learning by road from primary school all the way up. So education is about learning. It's about performance in a very negative way. So, how were you discovered as a model? I mean, this gorgeous Jamaican girl. Tell us. Ah, I, that, that was not my idea, actually, because I had no idea of the, what the modeling rules were in New York. At this time, I was just finishing a summer stop uh, theater with nine um, uh, players and actors that uh, would do summer stop, which means in the summer you go to a college and you, you do a play for the summer. And um, this was... Uh, Tom Figinshu at the time, which I believe is in my book. I don't know, did you guys read my book yet? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to do a book signing. <laughs> so, I'm going to have to do a book signing. I tried to arrange a book signing, but I don't know what happened. Not enough time. Not enough time. As, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, anyhow, he, he was my, um, my drama teacher. And, um, he basically, after we finished, you know, and I thought, oh, now what do I do? And I said, I want to continue with the acting stage acting. And he, he basically said, well, you know, you could model. <laughs> he was like, you have high cheekbones. This is how he judged models, right? You know, high cheekbones. And, you know, you're like, yeah, oh, five foot eight. Five foot seven or three quarter, but you have to say you're five foot eight because if you walk into a modeling agency, they say they measure you, and normally they don't take you unless you're at least five foot eight at the time, you know. And, um, and I went, oh really? Oh, okay. Oh, well, then I'll do that because uh, basically I just wanted to go on rounds to do theater. And he thought the modeling is something quick, you can get some quick money to pay your rent, to have your you know, freedom to do that, while you pursue what it is you, you really wanted to do. And so that's how it started. I went to an agency called Black Beauty, which uh, was Richard Rountree. I met at the agency too. He, we were sharing the same agency. But I still did not it, it just did not click for me because my features were too unusual. You know, I couldn't understand why my nose isn't flatter. I, I you want to say I, I have my great grandmother's nose, who is half Scottish, you know, from the slave Scottish master, um, and I have her her nose. So they think, how is your nose like this? And your lips are so big. And your cheekbones so high, and it's like nothing. For them, they look at me and see an alien, you know? <laughs> and so, um, so I didn't get much work. I wasn't getting much work. And um, then uh, I thought, okay, somebody said, well, Wilhelmina Agency, yes. they like strange looking creatures. <laughs> <laughs> this is, you know. How many Jamaican models were in New York at that 
Do you know what I mean? Uh, it was uh, Naomi, Naomi Sims. Um, very rare, very tall, very beautiful. Um, and um, outside of, of, of Naomi Sims, I, I can't really remember. And she was maybe, what, one time on the cover of Vogue, you know? Uh, so I went to Wilhelmina, and she kept saying, hmm, well, you have too much, you know, like get rid of some hair here for the photography. You know, the little baby hairs were growing down here. And then I had to get up every morning, like six, five, six o'clock, and I was determined. And I was living in Philadelphia, so I was then on a motorcycle, going from Philly to New York to be photographed every day, every day, every day. And um, from then, I would go with the pictures, and she kept saying, well, go take more pictures and come back. You're not right there yet. So I think what she was doing for me was actually letting me work with photographers. So the photographers then can also show me what is um, you know happening with the pictures and where I what I need to tweak here to tweak there. You know, finally I just shaved my head. <laughs> I thought, okay. And she got so upset. She you can't shave your head. You know, because um, there's not there's no work for models with shaved heads. We bought it, you know? I thought, oh dear, what did I do now? So then they start putting wigs on me. <laughs> and then finally, when I got my first, uh, I mean, Essence gave me one of my first jobs, Essence Magazine. I was starting uh, yeah. <laughs> But Wilhelmina, at the time, had you know, a big reputation. So the fact you go and you say, well, I'm with Wilhelmina, mm -hmm. all of a sudden, you know, you you mean something, you know. If I went to them before, they didn't use me. And so when I went to, oh, I'm with Wilhelmina, wow. And doors are opening, you know, like all of a sudden I'm a different person. So Rich is doing is an a interview part after her documentary. works that, you know, being with the right people and, and they do favors also for each other. I mean, it's just not all given. Sure, they think, oh, well, if we use a Wilhelmina glaze, then maybe, you know, we can get a Wilhelmina someone else that we would prefer. You know, so a lot of this goes, goes on. So I pick up a lot of that stuff. So with Wilhelmina, after, then I, um, she said, you know, you look like a black Jean Tierney. And I thought, no, who is Jean Tierney? I said, okay, let me go look up who is Jean Tierney. Jean Tierney happened to be one of the, the, one of the biggest Hollywood female stars. Except she was white. And I thought, well, let me go check this Jean Tierney. And I said, oh, Jesus. It was kind of strange because there was so much similarity in her faces that my lips were a bit bigger, but everything else really looked like a, a, a mold of her faces, you know, and it, it was quite weird that, to see that, you know, but I have seen it in Finland as well. Very blonde, Aria, Finnish girl. We looked exactly, we looked exactly alike, you know, except she had bigger tits. It's <laughs> <laughs> a Paris. I, oh God, tell me how I got the Paris. You don't want to know. Only grown ups here, right? <laughs> but it's also in my book, too. I'm not telling you everything that's in the book. And then you're not going to read it. Uh, you know, I, I experimented with, with um, rainbow acid at the time, yeah, <laughs> to kind of like get out of the religious thing and with a doctor, of course, it was all, you know, people were experimenting legally, you know, at the time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was legal, it wasn't a problem, it was legal, you know, the care of doctors, you trip out, you know, and um, so I was doing that, you know, not too much, you know, just okay, that's enough now. 
um, and, and for experimental and to open open my mind as a as it's supposed to be. And um, I said to Willem, you know, okay, I'm done. I'm going to go to Paris because now here, you know, Beverly Johnston, and there was just no room for more than one black top model. No room. There was one, and that was it. And I thought, I'm just knocking my head against the wall. That's why I tell people, if, if you can't go around that wall, you know, over it, around it, but if that wall is just there, you have to move. You have to move. The wall is not going to move. And that's it. So I said, I'm moving. Because it was like Beverly, 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 and I just couldn't, there was just no, you know, and the man that was coming. So I, we were all, as much as we all wanted the same job, we still had, you know, we were friends. So, <laughs> so we were all friends, but you know, when it comes now to uh, the moving ahead, I had to just, I had to move myself. And so I, I got on the cheapest flight, called well, Sunny Lakers, and landed in you know, Luxembourg, um, which is the smallest place in Europe. <laughs> but very strategic. It's small, but it's really important, like Jamaica. <laughs> I see lots of very like Jamaica. Very important. And um, from there, uh, I, I hitchhiked because I didn't have any money, uh, enough, uh, just enough. And I had one contact in Paris who was an artist named Antonio Lopez. He said, if you ever come to Paris, just call me. And he was um, doing illustrations for Vogue and for everybody. He was just the most amazing from Puerto Rico, I must say. Trump asshole. But, <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Best artist in the world. Sorry about that one. <laughs> I shouldn't swear. Um, and <laughs> I go to Luxembourg and I go to hitchhiking. I had Paris written on the back, and of course I was on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> I was going the other direction on the side I was. And somebody, somebody pulled up in like this really cool like Ferrari kind of car, you know, like, like you see in the movies. And said, so, you know, you're on the wrong side of the road if you're going to Paris, you say, this is that side. And I said, oh, oh. I said, okay, thank you. He said, well, where are you going? I said, well, you know, he's hiking to Paris. He said, well, you know, I take you to a train station. <laughs> and you can get the train to Paris. And he took me, he drove me at the train station. I got on the train, there were a bunch of hippies with guitars and things, you know, playing and singing and just kind of like, nomading around <laughs> and um, I, I, yeah, the train took me to Paris. I didn't speak a word of French. I knew it was in Spanish, but French I didn't know at all. And of course, tried to use the telephone, <laughs> which is the most complicated thing in Paris you ever have ever had to bump into. So, anyhow, that's how I got to Paris and um, went to this agency, uh, called Elite, which everybody, but uh, again, you know, Wilhelmina hooked me up with Elite, but Elite didn't really want me. Okay, so that's in the book. I'm not telling you any more. Uh, you have to get the book. <laughs> but this is a very good point at which to end, but I don't want to be selfish. I want to give two people in the audience the chance to ask a question. Anybody wants to? No? Yes. I'm Jessica Collins Sweet and I'm from England and uh, I suppose I do remember watching your infamous TV interview with Russell Harty, which you <laughs> mentioned in your film. <laughs> And of course, we know, as you said, he's no longer with us. I just wondered after the interview because uh, um, I shared it 
Alamina when she invited me here <laughs> from YouTube. And uh, I so we can all see it on YouTube. Yes, it's on YouTube. <laughs> Um, it's on YouTube. And it's a heart interview. It's a heart interview. Oh, yes. yes, it is indeed. Um, and I just wondered, um, did you get a chance after the interview to talk to him and Lord Litchfield, Litchfield oh, after that? Wow. <laughs> and, and also one further thing, I, 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 I no, please that the, the Lottery yeah. Fund didn't have yeah. funded your It's your yeah. very good. Yeah. Lottery yeah. Fund, yeah. 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 because it was funded by the Lottery yeah. Fund. Yeah. 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 Uh, uh, uh. Actually, everybody backed off of me as if I was going to give them, you know, a rash. <laughs> oh no, I was the last person that they wanted to see after that, you know, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, I promise two questions quickly. Uh, I watched that interview live, and I was elated when I saw that. Welcome. Oh, you mean the Russell Hart? Yes. yes. Uh, she was elated at the way you had it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much.